Simon Mainwaring'i çağırmak istiyorum. We First'ün yazarı ve kurucusu. Hangi özelliğinden bahsetmem lazım bilemiyorum çünkü hepsi birbirinden ilginç. 800 CEO'nun seçtiği dünyanın en iyi 10 pazarlama kitabından birini yazan kişi. Sosyal marka danışmanı ve ödüllü yazar. Sosyal marka danışmanlık firması We First'ün kurucusu ve Mainwaring Creative'in sahibi. Markaların ve tüketicilerin daha iyi bir dünya için sosyal medyayı nasıl kullanmaları gerektiğini anlattığı ilk kitabıyla New York Times ve Wall Street Journal tarafından çok satanlar listesinde yer aldı. 2011 yılında Amazon tarafından en iyi 10 yönetim kitabından biri olarak gösterildi kitabı. Simon 2012 yılında Trust Across America'nın güvenilir iş davranış alanında en iyi 100 düşünce lideri listesine de dahil edildi. Simon'ı buraya çağırmak istiyorum. Herkesin A dediği bir jenerasyondan We First'ı yaratmış adam. Bye. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you? Oh my God, that's so great. I'm so excited. Are you excited? Have you had, like, in the last 24 hours, have you gone home thinking, how is this going to apply to my business? How is this going to apply to my brand? What role can I play in global social change? It's exciting, right? Because that's really what's going on. And I want to thank Sustainable Brands for allowing me to join you here. Um, this is my first time in Istanbul, my first time in Turkey. And you know how your body is 70% water? I'm about 70% Turkish coffee right now. <laughs> and I'm about 20% Turkish delight. And about the last 10 or 15% is I'm um, hummus. So uh, can I tell you a true story? Last night, I went to my room to go to, <laughs> to, go to sleep because the jet lag thing, you're all out of time. And they had one of those little mints on the bed. They kindly put some nougat on the bed, some Turkish delight. And it's so good. We just don't get it in Los Angeles, where I'm from. And so I called down the concierge, and I said, I really like your um, Turkish delight. Can you send me some more? And they were very kind. And they brought up a basket like this. So I want you to picture me last night at about 10.30 in bed in my boxer shorts surrounded by Turkish delight wrappers. That was me last night. It is such an amazing city here. I am awestruck by the sense of history, of culture, of the people and the food. So it really is a privilege to speak here. And, you know, we've heard so many wonderful examples from Koan and Marc Mathieu from Unilever yesterday and then from Jody and Samra today, but I want to talk about something else. Who, who is in the marketing world here? Who's in an advertising agency or does marketing for their brands? Can you raise your hand so I can see? So about half the room does the marketing, and the other half are actually working at brands and so on? Great, because I'm an ad guy, just like many people in this room. I worked in Australia for a long time, and then I worked in London at agencies like Saatchi and Saatchi, and then I went to the US and worked on Nike for five years, and then I, I ran Motorola for Ogilvy. So I'm an ad guy. I'm actually, I'm one of those Australians that you always find at every party. Do you find here in Turkey that if you're at a bar or a nightclub, there's always one Australian there? I'm that guy. I keep moving and moving around. And, but having had this career and wandering around the world trying to kind of find fulfillment and find meaning and find the recognition that you think will make you happy, I found myself completely disillusioned. And so in 2001, I left my job, and I became a freelancer, and then I became a consultant. And I don't know, you know, you know the movie Pulp Fiction? I was sort of like the cleaner from Pulp Fiction. I would be brought in to fix messaging for companies when they're in trouble. But even then, I got bored. I found myself around 2006, 2007 thinking, what am I doing? I've got two daughters. I, I care about the world that I'm leaving them. And also, my father passed away suddenly at the same time, and I started to think to myself, well, what's the purpose of me being here? And it was at that time that I read a speech that Bill Gates gave at the, gave at the World Economic Forum, his creative capitalism speech. And he said, government and philanthropy can't fix the world on their own. We need the private sector to play a role. And I thought to myself, that just makes sense, right? That's just logical. There we are. We're all brands. We're all marketers. We're all clever. There's all these billions of dollars turning over each day in transactions. Yet, we're not contributing to making things better, but we're so aware of all the different crises we face. So I spent the next three and a half years writing a book because I had no idea how to write a book. The first thing I did was I went to the newsagent and I bought eight books on how to write a book proposal. 
and I spent the first year summarizing those eight books on how to write a proposal, so I became totally a university, you know, clown again. So, you know, this is all by happenstance, but it was driven by a search for meaning in my own life. And I think everyone in this room can probably relate. The very fact that you're here suggests that you feel a sense of purpose. You're searching for meaning in your own career. You think that whatever you're doing right now can play a contribution or play a larger role in terms of contribution, con contributing to the world at large. And that's very, very true, and I think we're all very privileged to be working at this point in time. And I'll, and I'll tell you why. We have four alternatives for our future right now. This is a study that was done by McKinsey and the Committee for the Encouragement of Corporate Philanthropy. And they said, we have four chances at the future. It's this really, really long report, but they boiled it down to these four. Corporations respond to the expectations of consumers, and governments let them do it, and they start to contribute towards building a better world. That's the best case scenario. The second scenario, corporations try to adopt socially responsible practices, but consumers don't trust them. So it doesn't happen. So, corporation, so the government doesn't let corporations do this. And so we get this bifurcated system. We get government trying to do something, we get corporations trying to do something, we don't have the support of consumers in between them, and so the whole thing doesn't work as effectively as it, as it could. And in a lot of ways, that's where we are in our world right now. But it gets worse. The third alternative is companies refuse to work for global change. It's always going to be profit for profit's sake. And slowly the economic system starts to break down, but it gets worse. Society and corporations can't match expectations, creating a downward spiral of social responsibility and decline. And this is the summary of the four versions of the future that we face today. And I think everybody in this room presumes that we want a better world, that we want marketing and the private sector to play a role. But that's not going to happen unless each one of us commit to doing something about it. And so what I'm going to talk about today is, what would that look like if Mark and Summer and Jody talked about specific examples of what brands are doing? What's a 30,000-foot vision of this? What could the entire private sector look like in five or ten years' time? Because it's going to happen quickly, because the half-life of technology is shrinking faster and faster and faster. But this is the realization that I woke up to. You know, as a father, as a husband, as a man, as someone who knows what's going on thanks to the internet and sees what everybody's sharing across, across social media, I woke up to the realization that prosperity is not the wealth of a few. It's the well-being of many. And the reason everyone here in this room should care about what we're talking about today is because brands cannot survive in societies that fail. If there's no middle class to buy your products, you don't have a business. If the infrastructure of society collapses sufficiently, you won't be able to conduct business. So based on that realization, what do we do? Well, we start to look around us and recognize how the world has changed. Who here uses social media? I see lots of you with screens and multiple screens. Who here is on Facebook? Can you put up your hand if you want? Who here checks Facebook first thing in the morning when they wake up? Who here does it naked? We can all meet in the lobby tonight. There's great clubs. It'll be fantastic. 10 o'clock Australian at the party, the one. All right. Here we are. We are all addicted to the, the power of the tractor beam of the small screen. Lots of you are under there doing this. I can see your faces lit up by the screen. We're all, we're all captivated by this three and five inch screen. That's how the world has changed. And it's led to major, major shifts because what was a monologue where brands told us what to think, what to buy, is now a dialogue. And how has that manifested itself? Well, Arab Spring revolutions, as we saw over the last couple of years, suddenly the voiceless have a voice. Beyond that, we've seen domestic activism in the United States with the Occupy Wall Street movement, but so much consumer activism that's on the rise. For example, I don't know if you heard about the story here, but the CEO of Abercrombie & Fitch, the clothing manufacturer, was talking about how he doesn't want fat people to wear their clothes because they're not cool. That's called CEO suicide. 
You know, we're talking about the tragic collapse of factories in Bangladesh in the last week, and some companies have said they're going to hold themselves accountable and address construction standards and make sure they're more transparent, and some have said we've done all our due diligence and it's just fine. This is the active, dynamic dialogue that's going on, and it's only getting stronger because all of this is in the context of what is cyber activism, you know, WikiLeaks and Anonymous. This transparency is being imposed on brands. So when you think about this shift from a monologue to a dialogue, recognize that each one of these manifestations of this new dialogue are building on top of each other. And just imagine, not just millennials, but you know, the generation below them, they're growing up knowing nothing else. Do you remember you know, when the only way you could write back to a brand if you didn't like something was to sort of write a letter to it on the address on the box on the back of the cereal? And now you're like, I hate you, and share. How many times do you hear people swearing about the reception of their phone company when the airport, and you're standing there and they're swearing about the fact they can't get Wi-Fi? So this is now a very active dialogue because cyber activism, consumer activism, civilian activism, all of these are flexing the muscle of consumers out there, and it's only going to get more powerful. In the United States last week, somebody released an app that allows you to scan the barcode of the company as you're doing your shopping, and it will tell you which holding company owns that product so that if you don't want to support the, that company because they support a certain political party, you can choose another brand. It's becoming very, very dynamic. And so this is the context we now live in. So what do we do as marketers? What do we do as brands? Well, we recognize that a global community, an intimately connected, mutually dependent global community, needs an expanded definition of self-interest. Now, I don't mean any of us should get less selfish. It's fundamental you know, to human nature, but we need to frame our selfishness appropriate to the world we actually live in now, which is this mutually dependent, hyper-connected, real-time world. And so what does that mean for marketers? It means so many different things, but it means consumer expectations have shifted. And here's just a few indications of that. You know, Harvest Media came out with their Meaningful Brands report. And one of the most interesting facts on the left here, or your right, is most people would not care if 70% of brands disappeared. Could everybody here in the middle and everybody on this side please raise their hand? Everyone, please raise your hand in the middle or on this side. You are all free to disappear at your leisure and die. You can stay. That's what customers are telling us. If you look at the Fortune 1000 companies in the United States, the estimate is over 70% of them will change in the next five years. Think about that. So if you're not responding to the world we actually live in, you're inviting obsolescence. You're putting yourself out of business. Secondly, this is from the same report, 57% of global consumers feel that they can make brands be more responsible. And I love that. It's so passive aggressive. We're going to make you be more responsible. And then finally, from the Cone Echo Global Corporate Responsibility Study, they found that 71% of global consumers believe that they could actually do more good by working together with brands. So they're telling you what they want because we're in a dialogue and because those customers are intimately aware as to the situation they're in, the fact that government has so much debt, the fact that there's so much gridlock politically, the fact that nonprofits and NGOs and philanthropy have limited resources, the fact that they still struggle to get a job, the fact that you know, they've got this persistent sluggish economy in Europe and the United States. So they're looking to you as a brand and saying, what are you going to do about it? I'm only going to vote for you in the shopping aisle by buying your product if you vote for me by being more socially responsible. And if not, I'm going to tell everyone about it. And so that's the new dialogue going on. And this has led to an incredible opportunity for everyone in this room. For the first time, I believe, I've been in marketing for 28 years, for the first time, legitimately, we can say the future of profit is purpose. 
not because we all grew a conscience. I'm an ex-lawyer ad guy. I am everything you hate in other people. What I mean is that we can actually support the market drivers, these new consumer demands, which are to build a better world and use them to build our business. So we can get fulfillment out of what we do and also succeed in traditional capitalist marketing terms. And that is an incredible moment in history to play a role in. And so we have to look at the benefits. Why would you do it? Why would any of you in this room, why would your company you know, make this choice? And I, I know it's difficult for some of us in this room because you're the internal champion inside your company. You go to the, you go to the board or you go to the CEO or you go to the CFO and you say, I want us to be more sustainable. I want us to make a difference. I want us to contribute to the local community, and it falls on deaf ears. Why? Because they're still just trying to sell stuff. And you know what? This is even more true in Turkey. You are growing so fast right now, around 4%, that there's a real sort of drive to capture as much of that profit right now, but the danger is you're going to miss out on the larger conversation that we're talking about here today. So I understand that there's competition internally. If you go into your CMO or your CFO or your CEO and say, hey, we want to make a difference, they're going to say, that's great, it's well intended, but we've got to sell stuff over here. So what's the business case for it? Well, the business case includes clarity of business strategy. If you try and keep up with technology today, you're going to go crazy. I mean, who here is overwhelmed by social technology? Can you put your hand up if you get overwhelmed by it? I do. When Google Plus came out, I was like, oh my god, another. You feel like a mother bird having to regurgitate content to little baby chicks all the time. It's exhausting. And now there's Vine on Twitter. Before that was Pinterest, and there was Instagram. And it's going to continue. So clarity of business strategy will allow you to decide what doors should you open and what doors should you close. Because you need your business strategy to be your compass in a fast-changing marketplace. If you don't know what your story is, if you don't know what your purpose is, you're going to go crazy trying to keep up with your competitors, go into every market they go into, use every new platform that comes out, and eventually, all your customers are going to say are, you're crazy, because you're just broadcasting your schizophrenia everywhere. You're just saying, I'm this over here, and I'm this on this channel, and I'm this over here, because you're trying to please everybody, and you end up being meaningless to everybody. Secondly, you get employee retention, satisfaction, and productivity. In the US, there's a huge problem right now because highly skilled and trained labor isn't coming to the US anymore. They're staying in Brazil, they're staying in India, they're staying in China. And so how do you attract and keep the top talent? There's a huge fight going on between companies like Facebook and Google to keep the top talent. So there's a real benefit when you have a, a clear purposeful strategy, then you can attract the top talent because suddenly you make their lives meaningful by working with you. Thirdly, you get the consumer goodwill, loyalty, and profits. No doubt about it. That research tells you what customers want is for you to do something that makes your brand meaningful to their life. And then finally, you get all the PR and extra awareness, this reputation enhancement that comes from doing good. So there are bottom line benefits to actually leading with your purpose. And People think social technology, they think Facebook and Twitter and Instagram is, is an end in itself. It's the shiny new squirrel. It's not. It's not. It's just reputation management and word of mouth advertising through a new channel. That's all it is. It's absolutely timeless. It's just getting people to talk about your brand. And so who's listening? In Turkey, the very fact that you are all here tells me that there's this, this conversation is gaining, gaining momentum. But I feel like there's an opportunity to expand the understanding of sustainability beyond the environment to a sustainable practice of capitalism. And we're starting to see the same evolution in the United States. All of these companies have now changed their messaging because they recognize what customers want. Think about it. Coca-Cola, open happiness. Pepsi, refresh everything. Starbucks, shared planet. Um, Nike, better world. It just goes on and on. You know, Patagonia, don't buy this jacket. All these companies are turning their messaging from the joy of Pepsi to refresh everything. Coke is it, 
open happiness. They're all turning their marketing inside out and framing it in terms of the benefit to their consumers. So that's what they're all doing. And so if the biggest brands in the world are doing this, you've got to accept that it's something that is gaining momentum, that it's becoming a movement. And here's why. The return on investment for doing this. Jim Stengel was the global CEO of Procter & Gamble, and he came out with a Stengel 50. And this was a study of 50,000 brands over 10 years, and they found that those 50 brands outperformed the S&P 500 in the US by 400%. And there was a direct correlation between the higher purpose of the brand and its financial performance. Kind of counterintuitive, because people think, well, if a brand's doing good, Clearly, that's not serving its bottom line. Or a European study by Harvest Media. They found out that these 12 brands, there was a direct correlation between their contribution to personal and collective well-being and their financial performance and the attachment and equity of their customers. So now we have data points to back this up because we all know, I mean, in my experience, when we have these conversations inside companies, what we need to do is reverse engineer out of the business case. If you go into your company and say, we should do good, they're like, take a number. But if you go into your CEO or your CFO and say, I know we want to reach this de uh, demographic, we want to get into this market, we want to increase engagement and loyalty, and these are the people that are really engaged on these platforms and this is what they're talking about, and these are the values that underscore that, and here's why we should engage and make a contribution socially, then suddenly, your contribution becomes a solution to a problem that already exists rather than being another problem that a CEO or CFO has to solve. And so you've got to make the business case for making a social contribution. But this is the virtuous circle that I believe is in, that's probably the Turkish coffee just exploding inside me <laughs> spontaneously, like rocket fuel, it's just combusting engaging the Turkish delights, dropping into it, exploding, like pop rocks in your mouth. I have no idea. The virtuous, the virtuous circle. I think that's, I don't actually think that's me. We have a rogue mic in the room. Um, but the virtuous circle that I've identified is threefold. The success of your business will be in direct proportion This may be in con This made me feel at home. Thank you, sir. <laughs> but <laughs> the success of your business will be in direct proportion to the emotional impact you have on your customers. That's just marketing, you know, timeless. If someone doesn't care about your brand, they're not going to buy anything. But what's new is this piece in the middle. The emotional impact will be in direct proportion to the social impact of your purpose. That's the exciting bit. Why? Because it's a dialogue. Why? Because our customers know what's wrong. Why? Because they want brands to play a meaningful role in their life. And then thirdly, the social impact of your business will be in direct proportion to the size of it. So the more good you do, the more you engage your consumers, the more you engage your consumers, the more they drive your business and so on. Such an exciting time. But uh, what I really want to challenge everyone in the room to think about is an expanded definition of sustainability. We've talked about supply chain and distribution models and marketing. But let's think about a sustainable practice of capitalism. And what I mean by that is economic, social, moral, and ethical, as well as environmental. So economic, this boom-crash cycle, is, is hurting so many of our lives. 2008, global economic meltdown. It affected our homes, our jobs, our hopes, our health care. It started in Wall Street. It affected Main Street. It affected Iceland. It affected Greece. It's affected the EU ever since. It affected stock markets and, you know, the Gulf states. We have to stop this boom-crash cycle, which is driven by a small percentage of people taking the large majority of profit and then trying to course-correct when they've gone too far. You know, socially, we can't allow, we can't increasingly add to the ranks of the poor and expect that our businesses will thrive. It's amazing in the United States to see in, in California and Los Angeles where I live, the increasing number of homeless people on the street. It's, it's very, very disheartening. 
You know, morally, I think it's absolutely unconscionable that so many men, women, and children die of preventable diseases and hunger every day. Absolutely unconscionable. And ethical sustainability. We need to be able to enforce this through the rule of the law. And one of the wonderful things that's happening in the United States is a new type of company called B Corporations, which is B for beneficial, as opposed to what is a regular company, a C Corp. And basically what B Corps are is a way that you can demonstrate what your values are and actually have those, those, your commitment to your values be part of your incorporation. And then each year, your company is examined to see whether it's living up to those values. A totally new type of company that never existed before. So an expanded definition of you know, sustainability. So assuming that's the fact, assuming that we don't want to just be sustainable in an environmental sense, what does a sustainable practice of capitalism look like? And that's what I laid out in my book, We First. And here's the first part. The first part is exactly what Mark Mature was talking about yesterday, a partnership between brands and consumers where we align around shared values and a common purpose to sell product and do some good. So the brand gets consumer goodwill, loyalty, and profit, while the consumer gets to support that brand. It gets that social responsibility, that better behavior by the brand, the transparency, the accountability, the authenticity. And, I mean, just one example of that. Uh, who here's a mother? Who's a mother? I'm a father, but I've got my hand up anyway. I've got two daughters. You know, Procter & Gamble, they have a product called Pampers, and we've all gone out and bought diapers. Now, when you buy a packet of diapers, Pampers, by Procter & Gamble, it funds a tetanus detonation, uh, tetanus a vaccination for a mother or newborn child in the developing world. So when you think about that, you go, every time I buy diapers for my daughter or son, I'm actually potentially saving the life of a mother or newborn in the developing world. And to date, in the last four years, they've funded over 31 million vaccinations, saving an estimated 100,000 lives. Now, to the mums in the room, does that make a difference to you when you buy the product? There's lots of heads nodding. That is an alignment between a brand, its core values, and what its customers care about. The second part of this is something I call contributory consumption, where we end the false separation between living and giving, where a company only does cause marketing or corporate social responsibility initiatives or foundation work after it's taken its profits, after it's discharged its fiduciary responsibility to its shareholders. And this contributory consumption idea is builds on the work of 1% for the planet, and also Product Red, you know, we were talking about Bono earlier on, where you buy a product and it actually makes a contribution to HIV or AIDS in Africa. But it applies to all types of commerce. So let's think about it for a second. Imagine there was a contribution through every retail transaction that went on every day, and then every credit card transaction, and then every online transaction, and then every mobile transaction, and also virtual goods in the gaming world. But let's be realistic. Companies are not going to do that. Let's actually just say 95% of companies say, forget it. Good luck with that. We're not going to do anything. And let's say of that 5%, they all say, we're going to do something, but it's only going to be one cent on the dollar. We're going to take 99 cents on the dollar, and we're only going to give one cent on the dollar. As a function of the scale of contribution across those five sectors, one cent on the dollar from 5% of the private sector will absolutely dwarf the $14 billion raised by corporate foundations on an annual basis in a systemic and sustainable way. The engine of capitalism, every engine needs servicing. We can't keep running it into the ground and then blaming somebody else and then complaining when things aren't working. And then the third part of it is something I call the Global Brand Initiative. And this is an idea of a coalition of brands working together, bringing the best of the private sector to bear on social problems that are in alignment with their core values. So don't get me wrong, this is not about greenwashing or cause washing. It's not about saying, we're doing this over here, but we're going to go and support something green or cancer over here, when it's not really in alignment with the brand. This is about a coalition of brands who each say, for example, Coca-Cola cares about water. Johnson & Johnson cares about family. AOL calls, cares about um, childhood education. You do something in alignment with the core values of the brand. And we don't just bring our financial resources to the table. 
We bring our training, our management expertise, our infrastructure, our distribution channels. I mean, imagine for a second if you got Intel and Nike and Coca-Cola and AOL and IBM and HP working on clean water together. What would happen if we brought that private sector efficiency, that expertise to bear on social change and consumers rewarded that? We could absolutely accelerate the solutions we need to improve the lives of millions of people around the world. So those three parts come together, and then they work with government and philanthropy, because NGOs and nonprofits are experts on the ground specific to different cause issues. And government is, you know, are the experts in the regulatory aspect. So instead of just having two pillars of social change, we have a third pillar of social change in the private sector, and they all work together. What could we achieve? Bearing in mind, if only 5% participate with one cent in the dollar, we would more than double what corporate foundations contribute currently in a systemic and sustainable way. And then we bring all those resources to bear on the greatest social ills we face today. So this is the Millennium Development Goals. You know, you've got child mortality, you've got women's rights, you've got edu education, poverty, disease. What if we brought those three pillars together to address each one of these in turn at scale? What could we achieve? And so what I'm so excited about is that we all want to revolutionize our industry. We all want to be the leader. We all want to make a difference that our competitors can't. But today, for the first time ever, the evolution of revolution is contribution. We live in a mutually dependent global community. We can't win at others' expense because what it costs us is more valuable than money. In which case, if we choose to work together, we can start to build a better world and in so doing, build our businesses as well. And just by being here, every single one of you in this room is voting for that change. And do know from my heart of hearts as someone who has the chance to speak in a lot of places around the world, this movement is underway right now. And every single one of you, the best thing you can do for your business is to rise to this challenge because the market is rising underneath you and it will reward you. We have connective social technology, we have the rise of women leadership and heart-centered leadership. We have social media. We have increased awareness as to all the social crises we face. The best thing you can do from your brand, from a bottom line, selfish instinct point of view, is to contribute to the well-being of others. And the wonderful thing is when you do that, you will find the fulfillment, the personal fulfillment, that you just won't find anywhere else. So let's all work together. We are co-conspirators in this change. Thank you so much.